is a joint work with um, Anna Pavlova and Svetlana Brizgalova, who are both at uh, LBS. And Anna will be joining the talk a bit later as well. Well, I'm very excited to present to you all today, and I look forward to your questions. So as Dmitry already pointed out in this project, we study retail investor trading in US options market and the market of intermediaries who service this retail order floor. As you likely have heard, the retail trading scene has been changing quite rapidly in recent years. Commissions basically dropped to zero and retail brokers saw a huge increase in their clientele. So just to give you an example, in 2021, Robinhood alone amassed over 21 million active users. This retail investor boom is driven primarily by um, very young, tech-savvy, yet novice investors. A lot of them participate in financial markets for the first time. So how does a zero commission brokerage make money? Most of their revenue actually comes from something called payment for order flow, which is a payment from intermediaries that these brokers receive for sending orders to them for execution. And such intermediaries are typically called wholesalers or internalizers. And here we have uh, another example with Robinhood. There is a retail investor who places their order uh, on Robinhood platform, then the retail broker receives this order and routes it to a wholesaler, for example, a Citadel, for execution. In equities, the wholesaler can execute this order on their own private platform away from national exchanges. And this is known as internalization. In exchange for receiving the order, it sends the brokerage a kickback uh, or this payment for order for. What's in it for the wholesaler? Well, the retail order flow is quite well balanced and largely uninformed, making it the best there is. So the wholesaler just crosses those orders on their platform and pockets all the spread. Um, as you can imagine, payment for order flow is a controversial practice, or maybe you have heard, because it may encourage retail investors to trade more or trade very specific securities. This practice is in fact banned in the UK, in most European countries, in Canada, but not in the US. US regulators are currently reviewing it, but these discussions have been focused primarily uh, on equities. Here's, for example, Ken Griffin from Citadel testifying in a congressional hearing on GameStop uh, and Robin Hood in January. <clears throat> One of the concerns was that Citadel, an internalizer wholesaler, crosses retail orders on its private platform and other market makers cannot really compete for these orders. This argument does not apply to options. Options orders in the US must be executed on national exchanges, which mechanically should expose them to competition from other market makers. So there is supposedly no internalization and options. And this is what we disagree with. In this paper, we argue that retail order flow in options is also effectively internalized. We identify a friction that hinders competition from other market makers on options exchange. In particular, I will talk about uh, how wholesalers can execute retail orders through so-called price improvement options and how this often will amount to internalization. We will use special new flags uh, for price improvement auctions in the options transactions data. And we will isolate these wholesaler trades to build a proxy for retail trading and options. We will find that just between January 2020 and July 2021, retail trading grew more than 100%, almost in line with the growth in payment for the flow in options. We validate our measure using supposedly exogenous events when retail investors could not trade, such, uh, such as uh, broker platform outages and also ticker-specific uh, broker restrictions that were imposed mainly in early 2021. We see that the share of retail trades based on our measure goes down significantly during such uh, events, such restrictions. We also argue that we pick up a large and representative sample of retail trades. First, it represents or rather captures over 30% of the trading volume implied by the payment for the flow reports of retail brokers in the United States. And it also captures 15% of the entire options market volume. 
Second, we will also define alternative broader measures of retail trading and see that they're quite similar to our measure in terms of different observable dimensions. Our measure of retail activity moves with other known measures, such as small trade uh, share in options. It also comes with stock level popularity measures um, built from Wall Street Bets forum mentions and Robin, uh, Robin Hood holdings data. Uh, it is also positively correlated with the internalized share in equities, which is broadly used by the literature on retail trading and stocks. We find that the new generation of traders actually prefer short-term weekly options, which in our sample have a quoted bid-ask spread of over 12%. And for comparison, the mean bid-ask spread for S&P 500 equities are less than four basis points, so those are large spreads. Retail investors like attention-grabbing securities, leverage, and they seem to participate in trading frenzies. So perhaps not surprisingly, we find that these investors lose money on average. We estimate that the total net loss in our sample is over $2 billion. And investors are paying over $7 billion in transaction costs. So contrary to the conventional wisdom, they significantly lose also on most traded securities such as GameStop and AMC. And finally, we find that the uh, per dollar losses concentrate in short term purchase contracts as opposed to written contracts. Why do retail investors lose money? Well, most of this, as I already mentioned, is uh, because of tra trading costs. Just like in the currency exchange in the airport, they might be not paying commissions per cent, sorry, um, but rather wide bid ask spread. And otherwise, we find that retail performance is actually quite hard to explain with observables. If there are no questions at this point, I will talk about the literature. Right. Um, our works relates to several strands in the literature. We aim to understand the behavior of new generation of retail investors and provide insights into their activities in the options market. The academic literature in this area has been quite limited, yet uh, there are a couple of contemporaneous papers. And the closest papers to us are uh, papers in microstructure by Ernst and Spott and Terence Hendershot and co-authors, which was already presented in the series. Um, they also study this internalized uh, trades by wholesalers. Um, and not only actually, but uh, mostly from the perspective of price improvement. And our work indeed has implications for investor protection and calls for just better understanding of retail trading platforms. In this project, our main source of data is OPRA, which is Options Price uh, Reporting Authority Transaction Level Data. It contains all transactions in the US options market um, and it covers this entire retail investor boom. Open interest data comes from option metrics, while characteristics of the underlying, such as daily returns, come from CRISP. We also use public FINRA OTC transparency data for all of exchange volumes. We scrape Wall Street bets to build retail popularity measure, and Robinhood holdings data comes from Robintrack, which is pretty standard. We hand collect payment for order flow data from broker website, um, and we use this rule 606 reports. So we cover most of the largest brokerages in the US. And finally, we construct a sample of broker outages and trading restrictions also from public data using Twitter. And let me start with the description of the market. This graph shows you monthly payment for order flow. The red curve here depicts options and the blue one depicts stocks. Just in 2021, the payment for order flow actually reached to, uh, sorry, $4 billion and two thirds out of this amount actually came from options, not stocks. And importantly, the wholesaler market is incredibly concentrated, especially in options. The share of the top three wholesalers um, who are Citadel, Siskihana, and Wolverine, 
the big three, has increased from 70% to over 90% by mid-2021. There is a little bit more competition in equities, as you can see here on the right, but the concentration is still high. The share of the top five is above 90% is, uh, in both markets and options and equities. Well, retail brokers in the US are required to provide uh, the best execution to their clients. So they have an agreement with the wholesaler to provide price improvement relative to the best uh, bid and ask prices. To do so, wholesalers often use this option exchange mechanism known as price improvement option. And we can identify these transactions using trade flags introduced by Opera in November 2019. The flag uh, that we exploit is uh, SLAN, or abbreviated as SLAN, meaning single leg price improvement option. And let's go back to the early example with Robinhood to see how this works. Retail investor actually sends an order which the, um, which the broker then forwards to a wholesaler in exchange for payment for the flow and price improvement. The wholesaler has to execute these orders on the exchange. So they therefore engage their affiliated market makers who take the other side and bring this already paired order uh, to the auction on the exchange. Other market makers can potentially participate in this auction and provide an even better price to the retail investor. However, the fees uh, to break up such paired orders are typically quite high so that the most, uh, most of the trades actually end up being executed by the original wholesaler or the market maker who brought the order to the exchange. And these breakup fees are set by exchanges um, and they're so high because exchanges also compete for this order flow. So they're trying to incentivize the market makers to bring those orders to them in the first place. We spoke uh, to these other market makers and they feel that they're at a big disadvantage to wholesalers in terms of interacting with this retail order flow. And uh, well, our measure of retail activity in options picks up exactly those trades that go through price improvement options and we call them simply slim trades. Um, well, even though can I, can I interrupt with a question? It's actually Dima's question. So, what percentage of retail trades do you think are executed in auctions? Well, we cannot give a precise number because identifying those trades is hard in the first place. But I will show you some uh, statistics a little bit later that compare the volume of trading through our measure to the overall payment for the flow um, implied volume in the United States. So what we get is roughly 30%. However, it is true that even the payment for the flow implied volume is probably not the entire retail volume. Okay, so yeah. less than 30%. Yeah, we still think it's quite a large fraction of overall trading, especially if you compare with other I don't know, proprietary databases or what people typically use that comes from a single exchange. So um, the truth actually a related question from Dimitri, what percentage of all auction trades are retail? Do you think there are there are there or, you know, alternatively, how many institutional orders go through price improvement options? Do you know? Ah, uh, the other way around. So in price improvement options, the only kind of aspect we can analyze is a trade size, really. And what we see is that there is a significant percentage of trades above $20,000, for example. I will show you the exact table a bit later. So you would probably believe that those large trades belong to or are originated by institutions. So while we're asking questions, I thought someone had their hand raised. Yeah, but I don't, know, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, yes we, we can. can. Oh, that's wonderful. So I want to clear, um, make sure I understood what you said. Uh, you said that most of these trades, retail trades, come already paired. So it's from one retail trader to another, right? So why are they losing money in the aggregate? 
It's a zero no, sum sorry. game. No, sorry, that is not what I meant. Uh, sorry oh. if I missed. Okay. What I meant is that any retail order will get paired typically with the market maker order in order to oh, be- Oh, with a market maker, uh, I got it. I have another mm -hmm. question. Do yes, you please. think, you, as you know, that the options exchange, listed options exchange are doing their best to attract a lot of retail uh, orders through the design of their contracts, et cetera, CBOE being the major one, do you think that retail traders are better off trading on these listed exchanges then, or, or maybe they don't have control of it? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's a fundamental question whether this payment for the flow model in the first place is beneficial to retail investors or not. That's right. how I understand the question. You mean, I see, yeah. You mean whether it's channeled through the citadels or directly through the exchanges? Yeah, in our case, so we, Unfortunately, we cannot answer this question in this paper. It requires first better data, we think, and better understanding of, right. let's say, better reporting on the sides of a lot of brokers, because we know that, for example, interactive brokers, one of the brokers that is not in our sample, they would be sending orders directly to the exchange, to I those make it exchanges, for example. I see. So, yeah, so we, we so cannot yeah. trade those trades as, as well as we do with uh, price and Right, reduction. right, right. Okay. So Catherine, let me Thank jump you. in. So Ernst and Spat paper is trying to answer that question that you asked, but it's not clear that they're successful. I see. Yeah. Anyway, um, well, actually, I think we should let we should let Taisa keep move on. We've interrupted her enough for now, I think. All right, okay, let's continue. And I'm happy to take more questions as we go. Um, all right, if, uh, as I said, even though payment for the flow actually existed for years in the United States, it received a lot of publicity only recently. Um, the SEC actually has announced several reforms related to that. And in particular, the SEC chief, Gary Gensler, asked the staff to consider creating uh, auction mechanisms in equities, similar to what is uh, being used in options. And those are exactly the auctions that we study in this paper. Um, the volume of trading through this price improvement options, as I already mentioned, increased uh, over 100% in less than two years, in line with the growth in payment for the flow in options. And what we see here on the left is that there is a clear trend, but also our measure actually picks up some of the peaks uh, or retail frenzies in June 2020 and in January 2021. Here on the right, you can see another measure that is popular in the industry, which is uh, the share of small trades trades below 10 contracts in the overall option trading volume. And it has a similar trend and it also picks up the um, peaks of frenzies. However, we know that this measure is definitely much noisier than what we use in this paper. By looking at the composition of slim trades or trades that went through this price improvement auctions, we can tell you a little about the retail investor preferences. We find that they prefer calls to puts. Uh, they mostly trade at the money or slightly out of the money options. Importantly, we find that slim volume is highly concentrated in the weekly options. More than half of it is um, in the short term contracts, which is significantly higher than for uh, what we find for non slim trades. These weekly options may be the cheapest from price perspective, but in percentage terms, their spreads are indeed large, as high as 12%, 12.6%. The effective spreads are lower at 6.6%, which uh, is a sign of price improvement that these retail investors get. Of course, many retail investors, they might not even understand that these trades are quite costly because they're told that they're paying zero commissions and the fact that they're paying zero commissions is quite salient to them. What we also find interesting is that uh, weekly options are actually a default choice on Robinhood and some other platforms and this create the largest turnover both for retail investors and uh, brokers so it also corresponds to the highest payment for the for, for brokers. And I referred to this table before, we're also splitting 
uh, retail trades or slim trades by size. We find that a large fraction of them are in fact in, um, of micro sizes below $500. Indeed, the relative bid ask spreads for these trades are even higher, um, are even higher at 23%. However, as you can see in this table, we find that a significant portion or some portion of slim trading is actually in trades of large sizes above $20,000. So for the full disclosure, we're aware that there are some false positives that our measure picks up, and it's likely that those trades are institutional, at least to the conventional definition of our retail trade in the literature. In the paper, we also look at how our retail trading measure is related to stock and option characteristics, mostly in a regression setup. I will go just relatively quickly through this part. Um, we find that retail investors actually prefer options on attention grabbing stocks, that is stocks that have experienced high volume recently and are very liquid. They also prefer underlying uh, stocks and ETFs that are cheaper, presumably because retail investors are cash constrained and they're trading at the money options. Retail investors also seem to like leverage, or at least we know that the short-term options that they tend to trade the most typically have the leverage of 70 to 80. This low prices, high leverage, and buying or purchasing of short-term calls are all consistent with options being substitute for lotteries. This is expensive gambling, but probably still cheaper than traveling to Vegas. To start validating our measure, we first uh, check how it moves with the mentions of tickers on notorious Wall Street bet platforms. So here we simply uh, scrape Wall Street bets and count the mentions of the tickers on the platform. This forum is actually quite large now, it has 10 million participants. So here you can see the so-called meme stocks, the GameStop, uh, Bad Bath & Beyond, the Rocket Companies, and AMC. The gray bars are the mentions on Wall Street Bets forum, and the lines, uh, the solid line here indicates our slim uh, trading volume. And you can see that the peaks actually mimic quite well the mention, mentions on Wall Street Bets. Then we also use panel regressions to check such correlations more on the conditional basis um, and also look at more uh, retail popularity measures. So what we find is that slim volume share in the total trading volume positively correlates with the share of small options trades. Uh, so again, those are trades below 10 lots. It is also positively related to the equity-based measures uh, such as the internalized volume, inequities and Robin Hood ownership rate. We find little correlation, insignificant correlation with Wall Street bets mentions, which corrects though, if we only look at trades of much smaller sizes, which are likely to be um, traded by active forum participants. Okay, let me, let me jump in with some questions. People are very interested yes. in this. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I think Dimitri's first question is, do you look separately at trades you sign as buys and sells um, uh, related to this? Do the retail brokers allow for option sales? And then from Francois Kokoma, um, to what extent do your results depend upon your algorithm for signing trades? And actually, I'll ask you, how do you sign trades? So we, um, we actually follow Dmitri's approach so to advertise his 2016 paper a little bit. Um, we're using that approach to sign the trades, but we in fact compared it with uh, just a normal uh, quote rule and with the Lee and Reddy algorithms, they're very similar in terms of results. Um, that is with respect to signing. In terms of the results, what I've shown you so far concerned mostly the volume share, so that is the total of buy and sell and even trades at mid midpoint. However, um, later on, I will have some results on imbalances too, where we, of course, directly compare how much buying and selling, um, how much buying there was relative to selling through slim trades. 
I hope I answered everything. Was there some other question? Well, I think I'll let them follow up at the end if they want to. I'm not sure I communicated. I'm not sure I understood their questions, so I'm not sure I asked them correctly. So I'll let them follow up at the end. So why don't you carry on? All right. I will show more results on imbalances. Maybe it also answers some of the questions. Thank you. All right. So here's exactly the table for imbalances where uh, we compute how much binder is relative to selling scaled by the total volume of trade. And what we find is that such imbalances are positively correlated with, again, the small imbalances, so imbalances in small trades. Uh, and we find positive and strong correlations with all other measures uh, or equity-based measures. Um, it seems like retail options trades create buying pressure. And I will actually come back to that uh, at the end of the presentation. I hope I will have time. All right, to convince you further that our measure captures retail order flow, we conduct a validation exercise uh, using broker restrictions and also outages on broker platforms. This expands on the analysis that was done in very recent uh, literature in equities. So here we focus on firms that are popular on Wall Street Bets forum and estimate the following panel uh, regression. We check how the slim volume share as earlier, changes when the trading is restricted through the largest brokers. And in particular here, we hand collect uh, broker platform outages throughout our sample period. Uh, those outages are basically broker level events, so they affect all the tickers on the broker platform. We also hand collect broker trading restrictions in early 2021, which are ticker specific. And in these regressions, we will include ticker, date, and time of the day fixed effects. And here are the results we get. The slim share significantly drops when major brokerages experience uh, an outage, as you can see in columns one and two. Sorry. And it's particularly high, or the drop in our measure is particularly high when both um, largest brokerages experience an outage at the same time. Um, we also find that slim share significantly drops when trading in that particular ticker is restricted. Results are very similar in the original sample of uh, Jones, Reed, and Valor. Um, so that is the paper we, are, uh, we were inspired with. And then in our refined sample of restrictions, we find that when both brokers restrict trading, slim share decreases by uh, over six percentage points. And importantly, all of these magnitudes actually come from slim trades smaller than $20,000. And uh, while we view these results as evidence that our measure indeed picks up retail trades in options. Another question is how uh, representative our measure is of overall retail trading in options. To assess that, we first compare the slim trading volume to that implied by the aggregate payment for the flow from Rule 606 reports. And that um, refers to one of the earlier questions, um, I think, from Dimitri. So we basically take those SEC Rule 606 reports that are publicly available on Roca uh, websites and compute the implied volume uh, or volume implied by that payment for the flow. And then we compare that to the volume that went through slim trades. And what we see is that our measure actually corresponds to over 30% of that volume in a pretty stable fashion. It is actually also an economically significant share of the market volume as well. Then we also construct several broader measures of retail trading, at least um, to the best of our ability with the current data. First, we consider all internalized trades, which are slim trades, plus all single leg electronic trades with size up to five executed at NBVO, which is best bid or offer. And this is consistent with uh, Amstens PAT uh, 2022 paper. Those additional trades also go through wholesalers, so they're very likely to be retail trades. And this measure already reaches 50% of P4 implied volume. Then what we consider is a combination of slim trades and single leg electronic small trades. Uh, 
It is very similar measure to the one used in the industry, which is just simply small trades below 10 uh, lots in size, but it will be a bit cleaner because it excludes definitely institutional trade flags. And this measure already gets us to 70% of payment for the flow implied volume. And finally, what we can also do, or what we do in the paper, uh, we augment this measure with all single electronic trades um, up to 10 contracts and below 5,000 in nominal. This is clearly the noisiest measure of all, and it already overshoots the uh, payment for the flow implied volume. This measure is probably capture more retail trades, that is, they have lower type one error, yet they also include more false positives, com <clears throat> excuse me, compared to slim trades. And nevertheless, it seems that observables that are important to us uh, are quite similar between these measures and slim. First, we find that the volume share, those descriptives that I showed you before, are actually quite similar uh, for these measures. We see that they also come off with the same retail activity proxies as SLIM. We find that all of them go down also in, uh, by similar magnitude during the trading restrictions and broker outages in the US. Finally, they're not that significant or they're not significantly different in terms of their net pro profitability. Given that we do not observe wholesalers' choices on how to execute retail orders, we cannot claim that slim trades are fully representative of uh, other retail trades and options. Yet, they seem to be similar, at least in terms of the observables that we care about. All right, and basically with all of this in mind, we evaluate how retail investors or slim traders did on their option trades. We start calculations with the trade level performance and evaluate performance of all retail trades on aggregate. That is as if one single investor was making all slim transactions. We have all transactions and options market, but we do not know who exactly is making those trades. So we therefore have to make some assumptions. One of these assumptions is the holding period. In the paper, we consider one, two, five, ten day horizons, as well as the intraday and two expiration. Importantly, we will use mid code prices to compute gross performance and the actual trade prices to compute performance after trading costs. And on this slide, you see that our estimates of performance after costs um, under alternative assumptions are all pretty much negative. So retail investors lose money on aggregate on their options trades. For example, assuming that retail investors hold their options, uh, options positions for 10 days, they lose $2.1 billion excuse me, in our sample. And please notice that the largest losses actually come from the very short-term options expiring within a week. All these numbers in the table already include indirect trading costs, which are around 6.5 billion in our sample period. And these trading costs, they really far exceed re the remaining brokerage commissions, which we estimate to be around 1 billion in our sample. And here are the best and worst performing tickers, similar to the market from the viewpoint of the uh, trade originating counterparty, retail investors actually won or made money on NVIDIA. But what is interesting is that, uh, in fact, they lost on the meme stocks such as GameStop and AMC, while the market was a clear winner in those stickers. All right. It is economically interesting to look at this aggregate losses. It gives us an idea about the magnitude, yet it doesn't tell us a lot about the profitability per dollar of retail trades. And it's actually not so straightforward to evaluate uh, this per dollar profitability as we need to make further assumptions on how buy and sell trades are netted. We consider two extreme cases. In the first one, the broker does not require collateral, and when a retail investor writes an option, funds are immediately available for other trades. 
And in the second case that we consider, the sell trades have to be fully collateralized. So effectively, funds never get freed up. And I think it relates now, I'm remembering to one of the earlier questions regarding how brokers handle the sales. So we know that they um, allow retail investors to sell op uh, options as long as the position is fully covered. So either by uh, the stock position in case of calls or by cash in case of puts. And the table here shows the average slim profitability after transaction costs uh, under these two assumptions. So with leverage, when no collateral is required at all, we find that per dollar returns vary from one, minus 140% to over 400%, while without leverage, they're bounded between minus 40 and 40 basis points. We know that it's a very wide range and the truth must be somewhere in the middle. However, it's actually hard to imagine that returns and options can be as small and stable as around 20 basis points, given the embedded leverage. So and, question, uh, question for Dimitri. So I, I understand that this table to be based on at least the positions are opened at the trade prices, right? So do retail investors lose money if you compute the returns from midpoints, right? Is the loss solely due to execution costs or are retail investors also bad at predicting changes in midpoints? So what we find is that, yeah, as you can see from the stable with aggregate losses, is that the total loss was around 2 billion, while over 7 billion actually, or around 7 billion came from trading costs. So in fact, if we sum them up, we get a positive performance. So on the cross basis, they saw positive performance on their trades if we use midpoint prices. However, this is not the case for all subcategories. Uh, and I believe that uh, paper would give more details on that, but basically we see that in some cases, retail investors still lose even on the gross basis. But most of the analysis uh, will be uh, in terms of trade prices. Um, though even for this dollar performance or per dollar, um, sorry, per dollar profitability with leverage or not, we find that slim investors robustly lose money in contracts with less than a week to expiration. And you might be wondering whether our conclusions actually hold if we consider positions in stocks of the same retail investors. We cannot fully trace that indeed, yet we know that the literature has shown that covered call strategies are quite popular among retail investors. And we certainly see a lot of interest in those strategies from the new generation of traders on trading forums. And for example, as you can see in this um, illustration from Reddit, sometimes they just like the stock and want to hold it anyways and use covered calls as income enhancement. So what we do in the paper to address that is uh, computing the delta hedged and fully hedged performance of retail trades, again in dollars. In the latter case, actually we just assume that uh, the position has to be fully covered. And as you can see from the table, our conclusions do not really change. Uh, retail investors lose money at all holding horizons, and the large chunk of losses comes from short-term contracts. So what we find is that regardless of the measure used, retail investors lose money net of costs, and their losses concentrate in short-term contracts. In the paper, we show that these short-term losses are explained by trade direction. So um, in trades less than a week, retail investors robustly lose money when they buy options. Um, and in fact, they make money on written uh, call and options even after costs. And finally, with regression analysis, uh, details of which is in the, uh, are in the paper, we find that short-term performance is actually really hard to explain with other observables. All right, and since uh, I think I still have some time left, I would like to share 
um, a relatively new result with you. Here we study retail, um, whether retail trading imbalances and options can predict underlying stock returns. We again run simple panel regressions and control for some of the known stock return predictors. As you can see in this table, imbalances in call options robustly predict next day stock returns. And this predictability actually does not extend to longer horizons such as weekly or monthly returns, though our sample is fairly short to study that. This observation on this positive predictability um, together with our results on slim investor behavior and their performance suggests that predictability is likely driven by excuse me, hedging of market makers rather than the ability of retail investors to predict next day returns. So what's what's the basis for that claim? Do you see reversals? So I see you predict next day's returns, but are they are the next day's returns followed by reversals or not? Or are the changes permanent? Um, it's a little, yeah, we did not look at reversals, I believe, per se, but because we see that there is no weekly predictability, uh, it would mean that there's probably a reversal. However, the power of the test is indeed smaller given the sample size. Yeah. We believe that this, this could be a separate paper, in fact, because uh, there can be a lot done with the measure. Um, so we just wanted to have a first look um, into this predictability. And what we see is that there is only this short-term result uh, that goes exactly through call imbalances. All right, and maybe before concluding, um, let me summarize a couple of other interesting facts about sling trades. Uh, I will show you what other validation or sort of validation exercises we run in the paper, in addition to outages and restrictions that are already described above. First, we know that Robinhood automatically sells customer options right before expiration if a customer doesn't have enough funds for exercise. We therefore expect to see more option selling during the last hour or so before expirations in trades that go through slant code, but not through other trades or other codes. And we can find that this is indeed the case in our data. We also look at Robinhood investor frenzies, uh, defined as rapid increases in Robinhood ownership rate that were used already in the previous uh, academic literature on equities. And we find that slim order imbalances seem to co uh, correlate or co occur with such frenzies. We also look at options that are optimal to exercise during the, sorry, before the ex-dividend date, yet a decision for such yeah. exercise involves knowing at least the Black-Scholes model. And uh, what we find is that there are more early exercise mistakes in call options that went through our price improvement options or were done by retail investors. And this is not the case for trade types, which are more likely to be institutional, such as multi-leg trades or trades of larger sizes. Can I, can um, I ask, I don't understand the basis yeah, sure. for this claim because you don't, you don't know who's exercising the option. Is the basis for this assertion that when there's a lot of retail trade, then that's correlated with suboptimal exercise? Um, so we're basically looking at the share of open interest that remains uh, not exercised in those contracts that are optimal to exercise and how this share is related to very recent trading through SLIM. Yeah, so okay. this is the best we can do, given that we do not have open interest related to slim trades. Um, all right, uh, talking about the point four, in our relatively small sample, we actually have a couple of large stock splits in such popular names as Tesla and Apple. And what we find is that uh, slim trade volume of small sizes actually goes up right after such stock splits consistent with uh, retail investors being cash constrained. And finally, we study properties of trades that are most more likely to be institutional and find that 
um, they're actually quite different from SLIM. In particular, they do not correlate with known retail popularity measures in equities that I listed before. So internalized volume in equities, Wall Street bets mentions, um, and Robin Hood ownership graph. All right, to sum up, in this project, we introduce a new measure of retail trading and options and document increasing concentration in wholesaler market and options. We document patterns of retail trading and show that retail investors on average lose money after transaction costs. A large fraction of these losses come from uh, short-term options. Given the wholesaler and broker incentives in these markets, we believe that our work has clear implications for retail investor protection. And well, that is it. Thank you for your attention and your questions, and I look forward to uh, the Q&A. Thank you. Okay, so there's one recent question from Pedro. Oh, Anna's already answered it. Um, the, well, I'll just say the question was, uh, do retail investors roll their options to the next expiration week? And Anna says there's no specific flag for a transaction of that kind. Um, anyway, but anyway, at this point, um, I'd like, I, I, th I think there are some questions that I did a bad job of summarizing. So if, if you'd like to ask a follow up question, or if you have any other questions, uh, now's the time, please feel free to unmute yourself and use your microphone to shout out your questions. Anyone. So I have a quick question. <laughs> it's a bit outside of the um, the, the presentation, but uh, I'm an economist at CFTC, and um, the the term retail investors are getting um, sort of a lot of attention, even within CFTC, especially in the context of FTX. I know that's not what this paper is about, but I was wondering if um, there are any parallels or uh, ways to sort of draw insights from your research? Well, it's it's always about data, I guess. That's why we um, were also studying this question because finally we got new special flags and options transactions data to study that. So in terms of parallels, you would see that we find a lot of correlation in terms of what retail investors are doing in equities and options market. So I would expect that some of these patterns uh, or some frenzies would also happen in other asset classes. 